Hello, hello. All right. So today, or for this video, we are going to go ahead and start on the digestive system, chapter 23. Um, I'm going to try and keep this as short and sweet as possible since we had a pretty long lecture on the urinary system that you also have to, walk, have to watch this week. So we're just going to dive right in. Um, your digestive system has a in case you didn't guess, uh, several functions. So of course you're going to be like taking nutrients and excreting waste, um, but the actual components of these processes include ingestion, which is taking food from outside and putting it into your body, propulsion, which is those peristaltic contractions that I mentioned during the urinary uh, system lecture. We also have this in the digestive system where we are propelling food through a tube using smooth muscle, mechanical breakdown of food, mechanical as in like physically squishing it and breaking it down, which happens in your mouth as well as in your stomach. The actual digestion, which is you might think of as the chemical breakdown of foods, might as well write that down, um, using uh, enzymes or acids or other substances. And then finally, defecation or excretion. Okay, so this is the excretion portion for your digestive system. So your urinary system gets rid of liquid wastes and your digestive system takes care of solid wastes. You excrete liquid for the urinary system and solid for the digestive system. All right. And these things happen in um, specific places throughout the, the digestive system. Um, I want you to note that um, you are a donut, right? So uh, remember we talked about how the epithelial tissue of your skin is keratinized, right? But it's that stratified squamous epithelium, the multiple layers of those pancake shaped cells that um, protect your skin, right? Well, you also have stratified squamous epithelium all throughout the mucosa of your digestive tract because it's basically also exposed to the outside environment. So everything from your mouth to your anus is technically exposed to the outside environment. And we call this tube, which you can think of as being the hole in the donut that is you, um, as uh, it's called the alimentary canal, okay? So from mouth to anus is the alimentary canal. So that includes all of the tubes that are your digestive system, if you thought of it as one long tube. Your digestive system, at least the vast majority of your digestive system, your stomach basically on down, is contained in your abdominal pelvic cavity, but specifically in a space that we call the peritoneum. So recall when we talked about the um, cardiovascular system and the respiratory systems that we have separate uh, cavities that we place those organs in. Um, you have the mediastinum that the heart lives in, in the center of your thoracic cavity. And then you had the pleural cavities left and right um, for each of your lungs. Well, for your digestive system, you have the peritoneum, okay? This is the name of the cavity within your abdominal pelvic cavity, okay? The peritoneal cavity. Okay. Is the anatomical term for the cavity that your digestive system exists in, um, or most of it. Okay. So literally from everything here on down, which is basically your stomach down to your rectum. As with all of the other body cavities that we have talked about so far, you do have serous membranes, right? You have a parietal membrane and a visceral membrane. And just like we called them the parietal and visceral pleura um, for your lungs, we call them the parietal and visceral peritoneum for your digestive system, okay? So the parietal peritoneum is lining the cavity Actually, let's do it this way. We'll color code, got a color code. 
So the parietal peritoneum is lining the abdominal pelvic cavity, which is what we call the combination between your abdominal cavity and your pelvic cavity. And it lines the cavity, everything besides where your kidneys are, right? Because your kidneys actually exist posterior to this cavity. They're not actually part of this peritoneal cavity. And the visceral peritoneum, which is the serous membrane that covers your organs, okay? So it actually covers the stomach and it covers the intestines and it covers all of that stuff, okay? So we have a parietal membrane lining the cavity and a visceral membrane covering the organs. In between those two peritoneums, you have the peritoneal cavity, right? Which is very small. It's a very small slit-like space in between the two because they're basically rubbing against each other. Um, so the visceral peritoneum is basically right up against the parietal peritoneum. And as your um, digestive system physically moves with those peristaltic contractions and stuff as move as, as food is moving through your digestive system, your viscera, your um, digestive organs, your stomach and your intestines and stuff, they're actually physically moving. So it, it actually gives you this nice um, safe way to do that without twisting your gut up um, and without it getting stuck in places. Um, in that peritoneal cavity, you are going to have ex uh, extracellular fluid or interstitial fluid. Interstitial fluid, which is going to increase with the lubrication and allow for your guts to move around freely <laughs> inside of the visceral uh, peritoneum. Um, protected also by the parietal peritoneum, okay? So they basically get to like slip around in there, which is very important because you don't want them to get stuck and you don't want them to get twisted. All right, so histological organization. This is the tissue levels of your gut, of your digestive system. So your digestive system, the vast majority of it or the digestive system proper, the organs that we think of when we think of digestive system, your stomach, your small intestine, your large intestine, your esophagus, uh, and your mouth really all have uh, this similar histological organization. You have three layers as per usual. I'm sorry, you have four layers for the digestive system. Three are ones that we have seen before, plus one extra. In the digestive system, you have the mucosa, which is the innermost layer, which is actually surrounding the lumen which is what we call the hollow space in the middle of these hollow organs. Um, and this is, again, epithelial tissue. Um, it's ranging from stratified squamous to simple columnar epithelium in some places, but it's all epithelial tissue, the mucosa. The submucosa is deep to the mucosa. So it's this white layer, basically from here to here. Oh gosh, I'm so sorry. I marked the wrong thing. It is from here to here, okay, the submucosa. So the mucosa, has its own connective tissue underlying it. So anytime you have epithelial tissue, if you remember from histology, you have the basal lamina that it sits on, which is always connective tissue, okay? So you've got your mucosa from here to here, your submucosa from here to here, your muscularis from there to there, um, which can have multiple layers depending on which organs we're talking about, but it's going to be dominated by smooth muscle no matter what. And the serosa, which is just a connective tissue membrane that surrounds the tube or the organ, the hollow organ. 
This is beneath, underneath the visceral uh, peritoneum, okay? So these are the things that you need to know, that the mucosa it has an epithelial layer, the muscular, the muscularis is smooth muscle, uh, the submucosa is um, dense irregular connective tissue, and the, the serosa is also connective tissue. Okay. Here's another image um, of the same thing. You can still see the layers here, but in addition, we are seeing the kind of the, this infolding um, of what appears to be the small intestine here, a little segment of the small intestine. So all of this verbiage is the same, just a different picture. You've got these folds within the small intestine, which helps it to expand. But in addition, every square inch of this um, inner wall is covered in epithelial cells, which um, <laughs> are arranged in such a way that you have what are called uh, villi or microvilli. Okay. So basically, the pink part of this that you can barely see here in between these two lines are each little epithelial cell. And so the cells are arranged on these villi and these villi give the small intestine this like cool like shag carpet look on the inside. Um, and that just increases the surface area for absorption of nutrients, okay? So all, every single one of these little bumps, if you were to spread them out, like all of it, all of these, and then all of these as well, and spread it all that until it was all flat, you'd have like a tennis court <laughs> sized flat piece of tissue, which would be really weird. Um, but that's how much surface area is packed into your little small intestine, which is pretty cool. Um, so this is basically just showing you the same thing. Mucosa, uh, submucosa, deep to it, which is kind of purple here, this purple part from here to here. Um, there your muscularis externa, which again, smooth muscle, and then your serosa and your visceral peritoneum right on top of that, okay? All right, so who are the players here? We know where they live, uh, we know what tissues they're made out of, and so who are they? They start, we start out with the mouth, which is called the oral cavity, if you're going to be very anatomical and clinical about it. Then we go on down to the pharynx, which we have already encountered in the respiratory system, which we'll talk about again, down to the esophagus, which leads to the stomach, which leads into the small intestine, which leads into the large intestine, which leads to the anus, the exit, right? That is your alimentary canal. And these are kind of the digestive system hollow organs. of the digestive system proper. Other parts of the digestive system are not hollow organs and we call them accessory digestive organs. So they don't actually do the digesting themselves but they might produce some of the enzymes and chemical components that contribute to, di to digestion, excuse me. So accessory organs um, or contribute to mechanical digestion in the case of the teeth and the tongue chemical digestion in the case of your gallbladder, gallbladder, salivary gland, the plural, your pancreas and your liver. Okay, so all of these guys are considered to be part of the digestive system. Some of them are also part of other systems, right? Remember we talked about the pancreas uh, when we talked about um, the endocrine system. So the endocrine system um, and the digestive system share that organ. Um, yeah, so we need to know the large intestine, the small intestine, the anus, the liver, the gallbladder, the stomach, the pancreas, your salivary glands, your mouth, your tongue. We will talk about the different um, 
stretches of your small intestine. So we actually have names for basically we divide into three different segments. Um, so we'll talk about those probably next week. Um, but for now, esophagus and pharynx, of course. Oh, three different types of salivary glands we will talk about. Um, and we will talk about the different parts of the large intestine. and the anal canal leading down to the anus. So everything in that picture. That's a good picture. Keep an eye on that picture. It's got everything you need, nothing you don't. Okay, so starting with the oral cavity, let's start where it all begins. This is the only place where ingestion happens or it's the only place where ingestion should happen <laughs> normally, okay? So this is where you ingest your food. It's where you take the food from outside and put it inside your body. Your oral cavity uh, is bound by your cheeks um, on the lateral sides, by your palate on top, makes the roof. Your tongue makes the floor, basically. Um, and your lips make the anterior part, okay? So your lips and cheeks help to keep saliva and food inside of your mouth while you are chewing um, and mechanically digesting your food. So that chewing, which is called mastication specifically, technically, um, is mechanical digestion that occurs thanks to your teeth and your tongue. So your tongue is moving food around, breaking it up, and your teeth is, of course, mashing and tearing and breaking up your food. That's the mechanical digestion part. The chemical digestion of your food also begins in your oral cavity. It begins with your saliva. So that chemical digestion is done with saliva. It contains enzymes that break down starch. So as soon as you eat a starchy food, it begins to be digested technically in your mouth. It starts being broken down from a long chain of glucose molecules, if you remember back from the chemistry part in part A, um, down into its constituent glucose molecules or other disaccharides. Your oral cavity uh, again has a, a mucosa, right? This is that epithelial tissue. It's that non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. It's the same as the skin on your face, except it's not keratinized. Uh, in fact, certain parts like the top of your tongue, uh, the roof of your mouth, your gums even, um, are slightly keratinized because of how much abrasion happens in your mouth. So, but for the most part, it's not keratinized, but you have squamous, um, si oh, you have stratified squamous epithelium that basically has lots and lots of layers of these little pancake shaped cells that provide protection against abrasion basically okay so the mucosa is made of of stratified squamous epithelium okay so your the roof of your mouth is made up of your hard palate and your soft palate the hard palate is is your palatine bones back from skeletal system facial bones right the soft palate is past that and uh, terminates down in your uvula, which we learned about with the respiratory system. Um, we talked about palatine tonsils back in the immune system. Here is your tongue, which is just a ginormous muscle, really amazing actually. Behind your tongue, you have your oropharynx. Just past that, you have your laryngopharynx. Okay, so your oropharynx your laryngopharynx, your epiglottis keeps your food from going down your breathing tube or your trachea. We talked about that in the respiratory system. And your esophagus is where your food should actually go down. Very important. Um, from this perspective, you have your upper and lower lips. Um, you have your gums or your gingiva, um, your hard palate, soft palate, uvula, we can see a little bit of the oropharynx from here. We can see the tongue, more gingiva. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about the salivary glands. You have three pairs of salivary glands. The first pair is your parotid glands. 
these are your right and left and they are like up here these are the ones that for me anyway like just kill when i eat something really salty or something really sour for the first time you get that crazy cramping sensation happening in your parotid glands um, and that's because they're trying so hard to create enough saliva for this like super tasty food <laughs> that you are ingesting. Um, and it, they can't actually like secrete it into your mouth fast enough. So it gets like backed up in the gland and it hurts. Um, so that's your, that's your parotid glands. You also have submandibular glands, which are down here. And these ones can get a little bit um, blocked up um, or painful. All of your salivary glands can get a little blocked up and painful. They can get impacted, um, which sucks and may even be, need to be removed. Um, but your submandibular are below your mandible, right? Submandibular. And then your sublingual glands are underneath your tongue. And you can actually see the opening, the duct, if you lift your tongue and look underneath. If you eat something that's like super duper tasty and you're extremely hungry, you may have actually like, like squirted out of your sublingual glands. It happens. Some people can do it like on command, which is kind of weird, um, but that's a thing. And so your saliva has this chemical or sorry, I guess it's more of a, it's a, it's a biological molecule called salivary amylase. It's an enzyme. And it is an enzyme that breaks down starch, okay? So when your parotid, submandibular, and sublingual glands are activated by putting something in your mouth or even just thinking about food or smelling food or even seeing food, um, all of those things can trigger your salivary glands to start working. Um, and now I'm like, my mouth is watering just because I'm thinking about it. Um, Chewing, the act of chewing will activate your salivary glands as well. Um, but once they start going, um, the enzymes in there, in there will break down starch as it comes in, which is why if you eat some, sometimes if you eat starchy foods, it starts to taste a little bit sweet um, before you swallow it. It's because it's breaking that starch down into sugars, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, it won't digest the inside of your mouth because you have this good mucosa that uh, stratified squamous epithelium that protects the soft tissues in your mouth from these enzymes. All right, your teeth. So this image shows you when these teeth first show up. The deciduous teeth or milk teeth or baby teeth um, show up between about six months um, to the two year mark for your for the anterior portions. And then you start like growing your molars, as most of us know, like up and into possibly like your early 20s. Um, and those are your permanent teeth, right? But your baby teeth include your incisors, your canines, and your premolars, okay? Your teeth are for mastication, which is chewing. You, uh, most people when you are grown have <laughs> eight incisors, so four on the top and four on the bottom. They're the ones that have a flat edge for like uh, biting things off for like cutting. You have four canines, one, two, three, four, two on the top, two on the bottom for tearing. And you have eight premolars. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Four on the top, four on the bottom. They're also known as bicuspids. Because if you feel them, you can tell that they have two points or two cusps. And then when you're a grown adult and you didn't have an impacted molar or have your wisdom teeth removed, then you would have 12 molars, which is literally three on each side on the top and three on each side on the bottom. I actually have, oh no, I'm, I'm missing my two bottom ones, but they just never, they just never arrived. They were never a thing, but I have all three on the top, which is why I have some crowding in the front here. Um, but a lot of people obviously need to have them 
removed the last ones at least because there's not enough room in the mouth or because they get impacted in either in the maxillary or the mandible bone um, which is like extremely painful and gets infected and you just gotta take care of that by just removing them because we don't really need all of those molars all right and each of these teeth has a, a similar internal structure um, which means that they all have in their on their crown portion which is the part that you can see they have enamel on the outside so that's the part that you can see and touch underneath the enamel which you shouldn't be able to see or touch is dentin which is a little bit softer if your enamel wears down and the dentin is exposed it's very susceptible to uh, infection which is literally just the rotting away that is a cavity okay and deep to the dentin you have the pulp cavity which is full of pulp which is literally just blood vessels and nerves and as possibly you know from experience i hope not but if you um if you get down to the pulp uh, it's excruciatingly painful right and the pulp extends down into the root and that is how your tooth um gets fed Right, so you have a nerve supply and a blood supply to your teeth. So your teeth are alive, uh, which is kind of crazy to think about. The root canal is where that pulp um, travels through the root of the tooth. Okay, so you need to know about the enamel, the dentin, the pulp cavity, um, the root, uh, and the root canal. The crown is the part that you can see and the root is the part that you cannot. Your incisors, um, canines, and premolars all have, a, have one root, which you can see, but your molars have two roots. So if you see a two-rooted tooth, you know that it's a molar, okay? All right. So, once you have masticated your food and you've mixed it up with that saliva and you've got that um, salivary amylase all mixed up in there and you start to break down those starches, now is the time to swallow. So you basically use your tongue to push that food back into the oropharynx, right? So this is one of those places that is shared between your respiratory and your digestive tract. Once that food, which is called a bolus, by the way, that little chunk of food that you swallow is pushed back into the oropharynx. The tongue has also pushed the epiglottis down to block off the glottis. So we blocked off the trachea, ideally, so that your bolus of food can go down past the laryngopharynx, which would be here-ish, and into the esophagus. Okay, which is posterior to the trachea. Okay. Our palate, saw palate, tongue. Epiglottis. In your pharynx, you have, you still have that stratified squamous epithelium because we are still protecting against abrasion. Okay, so that, that, um, the innermost layer lining the lumen of the pharynx is the same as in your mouth, okay? That mucosa is the same, made of the same tissue types. Okay, so we've pushed that food down into the esophagus now. We've gone past the glottis. We didn't choke on our food. We made it into the esophagus, huzzah. The esophagus is again, posterior to the trachea, okay? So you can't touch the esophagus. Your trachea is the one that you can feel from the front. Your esophagus is back behind between the trachea and your um, spinal column. It is about 10 inches long, which is 25 centimeters, um, which is pretty long. You've got, again, mucosa, which is, again, still stratified squamous epithelium. You have a submucosa, which is connective tissue, loose connective tissue. You've got your muscularis externa, which again is going to be a smooth muscle. 
and your adventitia, which is going to get up again be this um, fibrous dense connective tissue, as it is with most of your um, alimentary canal. Your esophagus stays collapsed most of the time when you're not swallowing food. When you swallow food and force food down into the lumen of the esophagus, which is white here, the Epithelial cells of the mucosa also have mechanoreceptors among them, and those mechanoreceptors will sense the stretch of the esophagus and trigger peristaltic contractions, okay? So here's a, a little cartoon of this. So you've got your tongue basically um, pushing against the roof of your mouth and pushing that food back. Your epiglottis is um, bent down to close off your glottis to your trachea. Um, once that food goes past the laryngopharynx and into the esophagus, the esophagus walls will feel that stretch via mechanoreceptors and you start to have peristalsis. So this is this little pinching right here is the start of the peristalsis. And it's literally just the smooth muscle contracting in a ring right around the top of where the food is. And then that contracted part basically continues all the way down the tube and pushes the food all the way down. So it's basically like a wave of contractions traveling all the way down the esophagus, okay? So you get all the way down to the stomach that way. You have to go through the diaphragm, by the way. So there's actually a hole in your diaphragm that your esophagus goes through and all of your food has to get through your diaphragm to get to your stomach because your stomach is underneath or inferior to your diaphragm. It's pretty cool. The mucosa is again stratified squamous epithelium because again, we have abrasion that can happen here. So we wanna protect against mechanical damage of the esophagus. The esophagus will terminate in the gastroesophageal sphincter, um, which I love to say, it is literally just the opening of your esophagus into your stomach, and it will close after the bolus has passed into the stomach to prevent stomach acid from splashing up into your esophagus. If stomach acid splashes up into your esophagus, we call that heartburn right? Acid reflux. We call it heartburn because when it goes up to your esophagus, the pain, the burning sensation in your esophagus is about at the level of your heart. Um, so it feels like your heart is burning, but it's really your esophagus behind it. Okay, so here's another image showing your peristaltic contractions, um, the contraction happening behind the bolus of food um, and continuing all the way down, pushing that food all the way down into the stomach. This also occurs in the small intestine, okay? So this is not just an esophagus thing, it's also a small intestine thing. So it's your esophagus and your small intestine, mostly, okay? So basically it's a wave of contractions that continues down until everything has been pushed to um, has been pushed forward to a relaxed muscle and then it senses the stretch and then peristalsis continues. Um, it can move your food all the way down your esophagus in one second. So 25 centimeters is that full 10 inches in one second. So pretty amazing. Bolus is what we call the lump of food, the lump of food, the chewed up food. Okay. So once the esophagus empties into the stomach, uh, passing through that gastroesophageal sphincter, which I'm gonna add here. Geal. Sphincter, there we go. Um, that bolus will plop into the stomach, which is full of gastric juice. Um, your stomach also uh, obviously has the three layers, the mucosa, the submucosa, the external muscularis, um, and 
the um, adventitia of the outside. The uh, muscularis is a little bit different in the stomach than it is in the rest of your digestive system. Instead of having one layer of smooth muscle, you have three. So you've got a longitudinal layer, a circular layer, and an oblique layer. And basically the, uh, the lines of the smooth muscles. So remember your smooth muscle cells are spindle shaped. So you do have like a certain kind of like a parallel stratification of smooth muscle. That stratification is gonna be traveling in three different directions, which allows for your stomach to basically squish from in, front, in like multiple dimensions, basically, okay? So your stomach is going to have um, kind of like peristalsis. I don't know if it's technically called peristalsis, but your stomach, once it detects that food has come in and it does that again with stretch mechanoreceptors in its walls, it will start to basically just churn that food. And it basically is like mashing it and breaking it down. It's basically like brutalizing your food in there breaking it down and mixing it with stomach acid. Your stomach acid is produced by um, gastric pits, which are amongst the cells of the mucosa, which is a little bit different in the stomach than it was in the mouth, pharynx, and esophagus. In the mouth, pharynx, and esophagus, remember the mucosa is made up of stratified squamous epithelium to prevent damage via abrasion. The stomach, mucosa is now simple columnar epithelium. And this is important because these simple um, columnar epithelial cells um, are also mucus producing cells. You also have goblet cells to produce more mucus. The idea here is that you have a thick layer of alkaline mucus lining the stomach so that the gastric juices that your stomach produces and is full of do not eat away at your own tissue, um, which would super suck, right? So we want to have a nice thick layer of mucus produced by this simple columnar epithelial tissue. Um, oh, you do have, it is peristalsis, I wrote it down, there you go. Um, the gastric pits throughout your stomach can be seen here. If you have, a, if you zoom in on a little bit, a little bitty portion of this, you can see in the mucosa here, these are gastric pits are formed and that's actually where the stomach acid comes up into the stomach. So you have gastric glands underneath within the mucosa and submucosa that are producing uh, hydrochloric acid, literally hydrochloric acid, um, to uh, secrete into the lumen of the stomach. That hydrochloric acid has a pH of like 1 to like 2.5. Very, very low pH, very, very strong acid. This is an environment where pepsin, an enzyme, can thrive. And pepsin is in charge of digesting proteins, okay? So you started out in your mouth mixing with uh, salivary amylase to start digesting the starches, right, into sugars. But once that food reaches your stomach, it's the, it's the pepsin inside of your stomach acid that helps to digest the protein now. So now we're digesting proteins, okay? Once you get past, or once you get through all of this mechanical and chemical digestion between the peristalsis and the pepsin digesting the food, you have um, movement of that food. Basically, the stomach is going to like forcefully like squirt the food through this opening, which is called the pyloric sphincter. Okay. The rugae of the mucosa. So remember when we talked about the bladder, how they've got these folds on the inside of the walls? Your stomach has that too. And it has the same purpose. It's to allow the stomach to stretch. Okay, so the stomach is like the size of a small apple when it's empty. And it can hold like two liters when it's full. So it's like gets huge when it's full. So 
um, that the ruge, this infolding of that inner wall, uh, basically stretches out as you fill your stomach with food. We need to know about the serosa. The lumen is the hollow inside. Um, that's really all that I'm worried about here. Uh, don't worry about the different curvatures or the different like regions of the stomach. I'm not really worried about that. I'd rather that you know the layers of the stomach as in mucosa with rugae and with um, columnar, uh, simple columnar epithelium and gastric glands um, secreting hydrochloric acid out through the gastric pits here. That's all part of the mucosa and submucosa. Deep to that, you've got your three layers of smooth muscle in the external muscularis, and then the serous or the serosa, which is the, it's the visceral um, peritoneum, right? And the adventitia. For this part, know that the acid, the, the acidity of the stomach is due to uh, hydrochloric acid, HCl, and that acidic environment is important for the pepsin to be um, properly active. Um, and that's produced, it's called gastric juice. It's produced by gastric glands whose ducts open up into these gastric pits in the inside of the stomach. Okay. It's all part of the mucosa. The submucosa provides the blood vessels and, and um, the nutrients, the nerve supply, and the serosa on the outside. I'm not worried about the details of this. Gastric pits, gastric glands, those are what are actually producing the acid. And then finally, of course, the pyloric sphincter, which is here. Okay. All right. Oh, and that is all that I have for you today. I left a blank slide so I wouldn't get too caught up with myself because I get excited. <laughs> so I'm cutting it short today so that we can continue this next week. Um, I will see you guys on Thursday to look at slides of the urinary and digestive systems and to dissect little kidneys, which is very exciting. Um, I'm looking forward to that. So um, have a great evening and rest of your week until Thursday, and I will see you then. All right. Good night, guys.